Okay. This is a video I meant to make today before I went into my other rant. Uh, there, same as before. Uh, it's my safety glasses. You can see they've got bifocals in them. I really like those. Thank you, brother in law. Uh, anyway, what I was going to talk about today was last week a lot of people were posting stuff about the March of Life. Uh, one of my family members posted it to Facebook, so it got shared with me. And it had some statements in it that were kind of ridiculous, if you ask me. Uh, <clears throat> one, it talked about the future generations lost, blah de blah as though that's a bad thing. Which it could be. We might have lost a Mozart or two, or a Beethoven, uh, or an Einstein. Who knows? Uh, but possibility is not a reason to force somebody into something. Otherwise, it would be okay to force people into religion because there's a possibility that a God actually exists. Do I think it's possible any God that man claims exists really exists? No, I don't. Uh, because every god that we know of that man has ever invented through superstition or fear or to explain the world around him when he didn't understand it has been false. So why should the current gods that people choose to believe in exist? Why should they therefore be a possibility? If that's the case, fairies, trolls, uh, leprechauns, uh, should exist as well. I don't use the Santa Claus or Easter Bunny argument because we know those were fictitious creations or creations based on real people such as Santa Claus, St. Nicholas. Uh, they're not examples, things that people believed in through fear or because they couldn't explain things. Uh, were used to terrorize children into behaving, behaving such as dragons and so forth. So no, I do not allow for the possibility of any god that man claims to exist actually existing. I would hope if there actually was a god or a being that created this universe, he would not be nearly so petty that he required every person to fall on their knees and worship him. Uh, beg him to forgive them for being born the way they were. Um, that he would accept his creations as made, flaws and all. But anyway, the future generations thing is ridiculous in my mind because the Catholic Church's answer to abortion, uh, instead of having unwanted children, is abstinence, which how abstinence would apply to victims of incest uh, forced upon them or rape then seeking abortion to rid themselves of something that was completely against their will I have no idea uh, but even so if everybody just adhered to that policy I don't want any children therefore I will not have sex because birth control is wrong contraception is wrong which if you believe life begins at the moment of conception what's wrong with contraception but if these people had adhered to a policy of abstinence when they didn't want any more children or any children to begin with, those future generations still would never exist. So it's an illegitimate argument based off your own claims and your own wishes for the same thing. If you believe all God is or all life is precious to God and God wants everyone to procreate, procreate, you wouldn't even preach abstinence. Uh, Catholic families would all have 12 to 18 children. Uh, religious families would all be huge. Uh, they would be unable to sustain themselves in this modern world. Uh, every family would require 10 acres of farmland just to feed themselves. If not more, they would be each family would be a tribe, um, unsustainable. The world would get to the point where it could not sustain humankind. 
But the all all life precious to God argument is ridiculous anyway. Psalms one thirty seven nine, happy shall he be. Some translations say blessed shall he be, who takes and dashes your little ones against the rock. Uh, talking about the Barcelonians, they were God's enemies. So of course it's fine and dandy to kill them. Uh, so therefore, all life was not precious to God. Uh, it's okay to kill people just because they live on the land that God supposedly set aside for you. All-powerful God couldn't stop them from coming in. Uh, Hosea 9, 11 to 16, Ephraim or Ephraim uh, prayed to wounds would dry up. Uh, that his enemy's children would not be born, so God, of course, obliged him, causing spontaneous abortions or miscarriages. Uh, and the wounds to dry up, so so much for all life being sacred to God. He killed left and right. Um, then uh, Numbers 5, 11 to 21, describes a ritual performed at the temple by the priest. If a husband merely suspected his wife of adultery, not could prove it, not knew that she had been committing adultery, but suspected. In other words, if he's jealous uh, and has unfounded beliefs, he could then force her to go to the temple and be put through this ritual and forced to drink bitter water, basically poison, that would cause a miscarriage. Uh, and supposedly, if she was actually guilty of adultery, then her womb would dry up and she would be unable to bear children from that point forward. So that invalidates procreation. It also invalidates the uh, all life being precious, since apparently a child of adultery, it's okay to abort, to force miscarriage of. Uh, numbers 31, 17... Moses giving instruction to the people, go forth and kill every male child among them, talking about the captives, uh, and women who have lain with a man. So any woman who has been with a man, pregnant or not, kill them. Uh, that kills both the women and the unborn children, plus all the male children. So much for that all life being precious thing. Uh, of course, the virgins, those who had not been with a man, and the girl children, you could keep for your own undescribed uses. Uh, and, of course, the apologist argument is, oh, but then they could marry them. Yeah, they could take them to their home, shave them down, give them a month to mourn, and then wed them against their will, mind you, uh, and then force them to bear children for the same people who had killed her family, her friends, her tribe, her children, her husband. Uh, or, well, I guess virgin, maybe not married, but you get the drift. Uh, Amalek. Yeah. Don't just kill Amalek and the men that he had with him that supposedly attacked the members of the Exodus, even though we know no Exodus occurred. There's no archaeological record. Uh, the route's been described. Nothing has been found to show that many people ever going through those areas. Uh, there's no archaeological evidence. There's no written record amongst the people who kept excellent records uh, of any Hebrew slaves existing in those numbers in Egypt. Uh, and therefore, no need for an exodus. But anyway, go forth, kill Amalek, his men, all the women, all the children, and infants. Specifies infants, separate from children. Infants, children, all the livestock, oxen, camels, sheep, goats, what have you, kill it all. Wipe everything off the face of the earth. Gather all their possessions, pile them up, burn them, burn the town, village, what have you, raise the earth so that nothing could live there again. So, so much for all life being pre precious, uh, the innocent children, the innocent infants, the innocent women, and any innocent men there uh, were to be
punish for Amalek's actions. Of course, the theme of punishing everyone or the future descendants of a person for their crimes is all throughout the Bible. Uh, so, so much for all life being precious. Uh, not to mention all the other tribes that the Bible describes the Hebrew killing or the Israelites killing. Then back to the Egypt thing. Um, Pharaoh was going to agree, was going to let Moses go in this story and take his people. God hardened his heart and made him say no. He didn't have a choice. He didn't have an option. It was God that made him say no, not Pharaoh. Yet to punish Pharaoh, all these plagues and everything else were sent on everyone, not just Pharaoh, but all Egyptians. And all of Egypt's firstborn, God sent angels to kill. All of Egypt's firstborn, not Pharaoh's firstborn to punish him. All of Egypt's firstborn. So how precious could life possibly be? Um, to wipe out infants, children, before they even reach a re age of reason. Uh, all life's precious, though. So how can you base your belief that all life is precious to God on a book that speaks of such horrors, instructs such horrors, that tells you if a man were to lie with another man as he would with a woman, then both should be killed. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Apostates are to be killed. If you go into a town but one person uh, worships another god and speaks of it, you are to kill the entire town, even the people in that town that worship the same god as you, uh, simply because they have allowed this other person to exist within that town. So use a valid argument. That's an invalid argument. Uh, claiming that life begins at the moment of conception. Well, if that was the case, you could therefore then remove those couple of cells from the uh, female womb and they would continue to thrive. Uh, that is not when life begins. Sorry. Even when a heart has formed and lungs have formed, it cannot exist on its own. It is not a life. And if you believe in souls and you think there's a soul there, well, if God wanted this child to be born and such a God existed, do you think there would be any way to prevent it? Use valid arguments. Uh, use true arguments. Use correct arguments. Of course, I know Catholics don't believe in the Bible. Uh, they believe it's possibly all allegory uh, as far as the Old Testament, the Torah books are concerned, mainly because there's a verse in James that instructs not to follow scripture, yet to follow the leadership of the church above you. Uh, so scripture could be false. It's not God's inerrant word to Catholics. So if their church leadership tells them all life is precious to God, regardless of the past heinous acts of that church, uh, the Crusades, the various Inquisitions, um, the witch trials, uh, all the other heinous acts committed by that leadership, then all life is precious to God. Again, a ridiculous argument when you consider the history of that church. And I'm not one to ignore the history. I'm not one to ignore the results of abstinence among a priesthood who was supposed to lead the flock and instead praise on the children of that flock. A priesthood who then covers up these things, takes a pedophile priest from one parish and sends him to another uh, and allows him to continue these actions, I cannot ignore these past crimes, these past acts. Uh, if these are God's chosen and God permits this to continue, 
that is not a God that I would deem worthy of worship. And I've had the argument presented to me that, oh, it's, it's a racial thing because a generation of blacks has been wiped out. Uh, they're doctoring statistics to what they want them to be. According to the Guttmacher Institute, 37 or no, 36 percent of the women who seek abortions are white, 30 percent are black. So the greater percentage is white. It's not a preponderance of a majority, but it's a slightly larger percentage. 25 percent Hispanic, 9 percent other races. Uh, there is a financial breakdown that since a lot of blacks and Hispanics are below the poverty level, they are more likely to seek an abortion, uh, mainly because they probably can't afford more children. Uh, but it's by their choice. It's not because it's forced upon them. Uh, so it's not a racial thing. And when it comes to religion, not all uh, Christian denominations consider abortion to be a sin. 37% of women who have abortions are various Protestant sects. 28% Catholic. 7% other. 25% uh, of women seeking abortion attend a religious ceremony at least once a month. And these are the ones who admit their religion. I mean, how many Catholic women, knowing the Catholic Church's stance on abortion, say, oh yeah, I'm a Catholic, when they go to have an abortion? Uh, so the statistics are probably a little bit off. Uh, mainly from people trying to hide their actual affiliations. These are the affiliations that we are aware of, that we know of, that have been stated. So before you try to force your beliefs onto everyone, how about convincing those who believe as you do that they should honor those beliefs? And if all life is precious to God, uh, then explain to me why 10 to 20 percent of all pregnancies result in a miscarriage. Uh, and that's the ones we're aware of. Uh, there are spontaneous miscarriages that occur so early in the pregnancy, the woman didn't know she was pregnant. So we're not aware of these. So the, the, the percentage could be off by as much as 25%. Uh, it could be that high of a percentage, 25% of all pregnancies ending in miscarriage. So all life begins at the moment of conception, yet 25% of life is destroyed uh, before it can truly take hold. Uh, that's according to the Mayo Clinic and a couple other studies I looked at. They are, they're all using the same percentages. I mean, some of them round it instead of saying 20, 10 to 20%, say 15%, as though it's an exact number. The number varies, goes up and down. Uh, which is why you have a range. So all, none of these arguments make any sense. None of them give any reason why anyone should force their beliefs onto anyone else. Uh, I believe it's that person's individual decision to make. Uh, it is not my place to force someone to have a child, uh, endanger their life, their health, their well-being, uh, to procreate if that is not their wish to do so. Again, like I said, why are, are there many, many more uh, religious children running around if the purpose of mankind is to procreate? Why do so many religious families only have a couple of children uh, and then turn to contraception or vasectomies or tubes being tied? I know of some instances where preclampsia was such an issue that the woman literally endangered her life if she became pregnant again, so either tubes tied or vasectomy. And I don't see any of these people who now rant and rave about pro-life running to have these procedures reversed. 
having a vasectomy reversal and trying to get this woman who could die if she bore another child pregnant again. Uh, they are, in that instance, choosing one life over another. Uh, rather than procreating as a religion tells them they should, they choose not to procreate, to use birth control uh, for a permanent solution, rather than to endanger the mother's life again. Which I support, but it's a level of hypocrisy that astounds me at times. Uh, the arguments are wrong against abortion, the ones that I have heard. Now, I believe that if a woman is willing to risk becoming pregnant by having sex with a, with a man, uh, then the man should have some say, or at least be informed. But it's still the woman's choice. The man's life is not in danger. His health is not in danger. He's not going to go through nine months of back aches and pain and have, wind up with stretch marks if he bears a child. Um, so it's a woman's choice. Do I think it's a waste to have an abortion when there are so many couples who would be willing to adopt a child, who want to adopt a child and can't because there's not enough children there for them? Yes, I do, but at the same, on the same, or the opposite side of the same coin, rather, why are all these people strictly looking for an infant to adopt? Why aren't they adopting the multitudes of children that are stuck in a foster care system uh, and giving them a permanent home? Uh, when there is such a need for that service, for that to happen, for that to occur. So while I, I do believe that, you know, a woman should try to make the choice, if possible, to have a child, even if it's simply to give it up for adoption. Uh, when there are couples out there that will pay her medical bills, pay her hospital bills, uh, and take this child and raise it and provide for it, it's still her choice whether she wants to go through that or not. It's still her body. Nobody can make the decision but this person. And simply claiming something that you believe through no scientific fact, such as life begins at, in, at uh, the moment of conception, and trying to use that to force other people to conform to your desires, your wishes, your faith, is wrong. Um, it harms you in no way, shape, or form. And according to your own faith, you're not to judge. It's God's place to judge. God gave mankind free will to do in this life what they would and will judge them at the end of it. So it's not your place to stop them from having an abortion. It's not your place to control whether or not they can have an abortion. It's not your place to condemn them for having abortions. Um, it's up to your God. So there should not be secular laws attempting to force people to conform to a religious faith <clears throat> or a religious code or a religious belief. So that's how I feel about abortion. <clears throat> you know, I try, I was speaking to my brother-in-law one time about it and told him, you know, to me there were gray areas uh, because my religious upbringing and being brought up pro-life and everything else You know, I still realize there are gray areas, victims of incest, victims of rape. Uh, they shouldn't be forced to bear a child that they had no choice in carrying to begin with is wrong. Uh, and he said there are no gray areas. You're either pro-life or you're pro-abortion. Uh, as well, in that case, I'm 100, I support abortion 100%. I am pro-choice, even though I may would prefer the choice to be through the use of contraception, not becoming pregnant to begin with mainly because there are health risks involved with abortions. Uh, either way, the child won't be born. Whether they use contraception, whether they abstain, or whether there is the existence of abortion. So all the arguments that these religions put forth are null and void. And how strong can that faith, that belief be, 
even within that religion, uh, with Catholicism, for example, since the Protestant numbers just list all Protestants and they're not all Protestant denominations considered a sin. Uh, 28% of the abortions performed in America are performed on Catholic women by their choice. Uh, so how strong can that belief be? How strong can that faith be? Uh, is it they think that they can go commit what they believe to be a sin with the preconceived notion that God will forgive them anyway? Uh, no. Uh, that's not the way absolution works in the Catholic faith. Uh, they must therefore then have a hold a personal belief that it is not wrong uh, and act on that belief rather than conforming to the faith that they claim to hold. Uh, give me reasonable arguments for things. Give me logic-based arguments. Give me something that actually makes sense, that has facts and evidence to support it. If you want to argue the existence of a soul, Sam Harris has a rather eloquent, in my opinion, and beautiful uh, way of destroying that idea. Uh, basically, it boils down to if someone's brain da damaged, suffers brain damage, their entire personality, their belief structure, everything about that person can change. They can forget language. They can see people that they know and not remember names anymore or not be able to put names with faces anymore uh, or names with objects anymore. Yet you want to claim that at death, their soul goes up from this completely brain dead now object of a body and moves on to another plane holding memories of that life. Uh, and being that same person intact with their personality and everything. Uh, and it's, it's ridiculous to believe that in the face of the evidence that we have. Uh, to think that you're going to go to heaven and be the same person is ridiculous because my parents, should their beliefs actually turn out to be true and they go to heaven, I'm an apostate. I've committed the unpardonable sin of denying Christ after hearing of him. So I am going to go to hell by their belief system. And according to some verses in the Bible, they will be in heaven rejoicing on witnessing the torments that I am suffering. Those would not be my parents. They would no longer be those same people. They would not be the same being any longer uh, to move on in that way. They're ridiculous arguments. Give me something that makes sense. 